Outside a church, a board welcomes visitors to the unkempt churchyard. Pamphlets in the church describe the wildlife and defend the policy, for there have been complaints. But when Mark Cocker visits the churchyard, he finds the ryegrass monoculture now so familiar in Britain. Even the daisies are missing. A broad-spectrum herbicide has killed them. Traditional use have been replaced with leyland eye that support almost no insect species. Other trees have ivy, a vital source of nectar for autumn insects. But the leaves are brown and crinkled. Each stem has been cut at the base. Chippings on many graves stop plants from growing. The only wildlife he sees is a patch of brambles and the remains of a sparrowhawk's pigeon. Yet the notice board and the pamphlets seem sincere. The complaints about untidiness were probably strongly felt. Nearby, he comes to a farm that grows daffodils. This is the Easter flower, Wordsworth's dancing flower, the flower that represents spring. But these daffodils are another monoculture. In lifeless soil, huge numbers stand in lines, their concentrated yellow resembling the color of paint or plastic. Yet in people's homes they will seem to breathe spring's abundance. Encounters like these reveal a great contradiction. If the membership figures for wildlife organizations are anything to go by, the British people value wild nature immensely. The Royal Society for the Protection of Birds has 1.2 million members, far more than all the political parties put together. David Attenborough's programs and BBC Two's Spring Watch always attract mass audiences. Yet our love has not prevented us from tolerating a shocking and still unchecked collapse. In 2013, the State of Nature report, produced by 25 bodies with expertise covering 3,148 species of wildlife, revealed that 60% had declined over half a century, 31% badly. More than 600 were in danger of extinction in Britain. For farmland birds, we have the worst statistics in Europe. Some are down more than 90%. Another monoculture, daffodils in Norfolk. Photograph, Alamy in 2015, the writer Michael McCarthy observed that in 50 years the country had lost half its wildlife population. Cuckoos, nightingales and yellowhammers have disappeared from places where they were common. A painful example for Cocker is the lapwing. As a child, he heard the birds call as he went to sleep. They are gone from that field near his home, and their UK numbers have fallen by 65%. Other countries tell similar stories. A recent report from Germany reveals a 75% loss of insect abundance over 27 years, attributed to pesticides and herbicides, while in France bird populations have dropped by a third in 10 years. If these trends continue, wild nature's variety will be gone from our daily surroundings. Why are we allowing this to happen? The question makes our place more urgent than any of Cocker's previous writing. His search for answers takes three directions. He travels, to see the contradiction at work in places such as the churchyard in Daffodil Farm. This journey, in the genre of William Cobbett's Rural Rides and George Orwell's The Road to Wigan Pier, shows him spaces where wildlife is cherished and where it has been all but obliterated. He starts on the Norfolk coast, where nearly all the land belongs to wildlife organizations, though not far inland, lie the agricultural prairies. Nightingales have vanished from places where they were once common. Photograph, Christopher Tudor, Alamy Cocker's second quest is historical. What are the roots of the contradiction? He gives us the tangled histories of the National Trust, the RSPB, the Wildlife Trusts and the Nature Conservancy, the main conservation bodies that throughout the 20th century acquired land and fought to influence legislation. At the same time, the policies and technologies were emerging that would deliver cheap food in unprecedented variety to a growing population but would prove calamitous for wildlife. Cocker looks at these, too, with special attention to the subsidies that have incentivized unnecessary destruction. The common agricultural policy is certainly one culprit, but not the only source of the evil. Many subsidies had their origin in wartime shortages of food and timber. He singles out historical clashes, the kind of scout trespass in 1932, the unsuccessful fight to stop Durham's reservoir at Windy Bank in 1971, and the partly successful campaign to save the flow country blanket bog in the 1980s. Windy Bank has spring gentians, and plants from the post-glacial period. Scotland's flow country, brown bog is eerily beautiful. Moss has created a miniature forest, in a rare place in Britain where trees are naturally absent. Here Cocker's writing becomes richly sensuous, and there is emotional release. But in this book matters are too urgent to linger. 
The power of those landscapes has not in the past provided a sufficient reason to search for alternatives to the industrial plans. Why not might the British love of wild nature belong too much to a transient, if lingering, historical moment The final intertwining strand is Cocker's discussion of values, and here he faces uncomfortable questions. Were the defenders of Widdy Bank and the Flow Country wrong to rely so exclusively on the argument that the places were valuable to science? There are two legal designations that afford a place some protection. It may be declared a site of special scientific interest, or an area of outstanding natural beauty. Interpreted generously, the second term encompasses the whole variety of cultural and emotional reasons people have for loving nature. But neither criterion is adequate alone. The claim that a place is of scientific interest makes rarity the test and seems to prioritize the concerns of experts. Cocker concludes the book with tentative recommendations, one of which is that scientific names should be used rather less, and new vernacular names chosen if the old ones have not survived. Another, in wistful utopian tones, is that gardeners should place much more value on unkempt beauty. But cultural, aesthetic and emotional valuations are relative and subjective. Cocker begins to face the possibility that the British love of wild nature might belong too much to a transient, if lingering, historical moment, an era when the transition from pre-industrial rural life was still recent, the love of wildness was part of the colonial imagination, and romantic poetry was highly influential. Does our love now carry too many vestiges ordinary experience used to include wild, non-human nature? It was around people as they worked and loved and took part in ritual. Wild creatures were a constant source of dramatic and mythical meaning. Why else do so many birds feature in poetry? One reason for the melancholy now felt by nature lovers is that the loss of wildlife threatens our ability to renew these meanings. And in times of environmental danger, we need to be skilled, collectively, at recognizing the intricate links between ecosystems. The presence of wildlife teaches us this. At least Cocker argues, the collapse should not be allowed to occur without communal soul-searching. His title, Our Place, challenges Britain, in its social, ethnic and generational diversity, to begin the conversation. This resourceful and eloquent book could prove to be important. Our Place by Mark Cocker Cape, £18.99. To order a copy for £13.99, go to guardianbookshop.com or call 0330-333-6846. Free UK PP over £10, orders only. Phone orders men. PP of £1.99.